Welcome everyone, my name is Brett Smith, W4HBS, and today I'll be co-teaching class with Steve Jonas, K4SVJ. And uh, many of you I have met over the radio <laughs> or through WinLink, uh, communications back and forth, um, but I do want to let you know. This is the first official Georgia Aries training class communications. And we're excited. This has taken us a lot of effort to get to this situations. Um, this has been an interesting year. the CEOs for example and in many cases this is a situation that actually occurred is it'd be two o'clock in the morning the hurricane was roaring outside 2 a.m. in the morning and the operators were in there working and the CEO walks in he sees these people sitting over there talking on a radio and he goes who are now who are y'all and they, you, they would introduce themselves, well, we're Georgia Aries, we're volunteer coordinators, we come in here and we communicate for the hospital. They were blown away. The CEOs didn't even know who we were. And they were so impressed, they would say, tell me anything you guys need. Anything you need, let me know. And in a couple of cases, they would call and say, hey, or the CEO wants to know what equipment, but um, here's what we'd like to have, but we're afraid to ask for all this. We need a new HF rig, and we need Signal Link, and all. And I said, fine, we'll give it to them. Turn it in. Here's our recommended equipment list. And the very next day, that CEO had their emergency manager calling in the order to ham radio, getting their equipment ordered. So, folks, it makes a difference. And when we're out there, it makes an impact. The second, the third thing that it brought to our attention was when you're in a live emergency, that feeling hits you, that awesome thought, that wow, this is what we trained for. We trained, we trained, we trained, and now here we are in the middle of a hurricane, and I'm in a hospital, and there's a lot on my shoulders right now. How many of y'all felt that, that weird feeling like, I'm here now, I hope I can pull off the job. I hope I can do what I'm trained to do. But the reality is, it comes to you. There were people talking all night long. And we had nets going, people talking back and forth. We kept communication going. And it was an exciting time. It was a scary time, but it was an exciting time. The, uh, the important thing is, is that our goal is to try to help us be as trained as we can possibly be. The more trained we are, the better presenters and the better performers we're going to be as far as emergency communications go. 
I want to talk a little bit about how this is all organized. As you know, typically when we talk about emergency hospital communications, we start with the hospital emergency manager. The EM is the primary person in that hospital that we liaison with. How many of you do not know who your emergency manager is at your hospital? Do not know. Michael Patterson, <clears throat> he's, he's the EM for Fannin Regional Hospital. That's my guy. That's who I go to see. If there's an emergency, Michael is the one who calls me either through Everbridge or on the phone or on the radio. He's also a licensed ham and says, hey, we're going to need you here. And bring your equipment, let's get going. So make sure you develop that relationship with your hospital EM. That's the key person. Secondly, there's also David Benoist, our section manager. David is a critical person throughout the state because he is the top voice that we have. The third person that we check <clears throat> happens to be taking a photograph at the back of the classroom right now, Frank Dean, our section manager. Frank is a key person for all the hospitals. That is one of our key contact people. Then of course, in every county, you've got your emergency coordinator, your assistant emergency coordinators in each county, and then we have our partner in this whole venture is Department of Public Health. And they are a fantastic group of people to work with. They want us in these hospitals. They want to work with us. And it's been a great uh, experience getting to know many of the people in the Department of Public Health. You also have involved in any incident the state a hospital net manager. Happens to be Steve Jonas right here to my left. Steve is the primary person who you're going to talk to on the radio in an emergency. And now in the event, and we're going to talk about process here in just a few moments, but the key to keep in mind is that when an event goes down, it may be localized. It may be only in your county affecting only your hospital or it could be regional. It may include three, four, five counties surrounding you, or it could be statewide. And if it's statewide, it could be a very interesting event because you're gonna have a lot of people trying to communicate. <clears throat> Those of you that are checking in on the hospital net now know it's not peaches and cream. It's not real simple, show up, do your check-in and walk home. It's challenging because HF has been difficult, propagation has been up and down, D-star has been iffy at times. The key is learning all the modes, WinLink, learning how to operate WinLink, because that's how we transmit communications other than voice. Work your HF, work your D-star, learn all those skills, know how to operate all your equipment because inevitably something's not going to work and you need a backup. So our role is volunteer communicators. What's really important to understand is that when you are called upon by a hospital, the minute you step through that door, you might as well take your Aries hat off because now you're no longer Aries. In essence, you're an extension of that hospital. You are a hospital volunteer at that point. You are there to operate under their incident command. So in every event, in every emergency, every circumstance, there's gonna probably be established an incident commander. And it's going to be somebody in that hospital, probably the CEO, it could be the emergency manager, it may be a designee of the emergency manager. But either way, if you are called upon to present at a hospital, remember, the moment you walk in that door, you work for them. And you are an extension of them. The goal here <clears throat> is that we are to work as a functional unit with that hospital. We are not the Lone Ranger. 
We don't walk in and say, well, I'm Aries. I'm, all I do is talk on the radio. Don't ask me to do anything. I'm just a radio. And that's not the right attitude. The attitude we take is, we're here to support you. Tell us what you need. We're here to support you. Now, that doesn't mean when they say, go mop up the bathroom because someone threw up. That's not what we're talking about. As a matter of fact, it's important that you, you have the right to decline any requests made of you if you don't feel comfortable with it. But our primary goal and role is as communicators. That's what we're trained to do. And that's normally all they're going to ask of you. But you're going to be challenged because it, every emergency is a fluid event. And those of you, how many of you just off the top of your head have participated in either a drill, a live exercise, or some type of, of training event that the hospital has conducted over the past year? Okay. How many of those have operated perfectly smoothly without a hiccup? None of them. It is chaotic. If it's a real disaster, it can be even more chaotic. You're the calm in the storm. We expect you to come in there and be able to perform your duties and help to calm things down. Because what you're going to find is most of the folks that show up at the hospital, they're walking around with their cell phone and everything's cool until, guess what? This, I've lost my cell signal. I don't have a cell signal. I don't have internet. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I have no internet. Not a problem. That's where we step in. And it's important to understand that, again, that we operate as a functional unit. The one thing that is important to realize here is that we must always abide by Part 97 rules. If a hospital asks you to do something, a violation of Part 97, you cannot agree to that. If they say, well, look, um, you know, my janitor here needs a radio. We need to be able to get a hold of him. Can you just give him a radio and let him use it? If he's not licensed, say, no, sir, I'm sorry. We can't. Just abide by Part 97 rules. All right? When we talk about membership training and communication operators, we define this in, in terms of two levels. We call a level one operator and a level two operator. And as we go through this, you can probably figure out very quickly where you fall into that. Level one operator basically is a licensed amateur. Uh, they have a willingness and ability to deploy in the field as necessary. They've completed the Gwinnett County Emergency Communications Training Program and or the ARRL Emergency Communications Course, otherwise known as EC001, which can be taken online through ARRL. They have active registration with GHA 911, uh, and they've completed the Web EOC training orientation. Uh, is there anybody in here who has not taken the Web EOC training and orientation? Are you all registered for the class this afternoon? That will accommodate that. Um, also, most, if, if not all, the hospitals are going to require you to be HIPAA trained and certified. If you have not been HIPAA trained and certified, this afternoon's class will, will be able to accomplish that goal for you. And so at the end of today, if you take all the hospital training today, you will qualify for a full level one operator, no question. Now, again, other things you, you need to have a knowledge of amateur radio practice, you need to have skill and actor in acting as a net control operator. How many of you have never served as a net control? No, don't be ashamed. There's a lot of people that have it. If you haven't served as a net control, I encourage you, contact your emergency coordinator for your county or an AEC in your county and say, hey, 
this is something I need experience in, running net control. Can I volunteer to be a net control? And they're, these guys are really, they, they don't like to give up the net control. I'm being facetious right now. They're always looking for people to serve as net control. Hey, just step up and say, hey, let me try it. You know, if you guys will kind of back me up a little bit, let me try it. You can't botch it up, I promise you. It's a great experience learning how to maneuver and do two things at one time. It's great practice for working in a hospital emergency situation. Also, um, you need to be familiar with how to pass traffic and by voice or by digital. Now, this doesn't mean passing ARRL radiograms like the, like the state traffic net or the national traffic net. The importance here is how do you pass information, whether it be through WinLink or through PSK or through by voice. It's important to understand because that is the bread and butter of what we do. And we'll talk in just a moment about how the hospitals are expecting us to serve. I think it's important that you, um, you have an understanding that as a volunteer, you're stepping in here to provide a service that that hospital may not even realize they need. They may not even realize how critically important your role is to that hospital until the time comes. And when that time comes, you're going to be the most popular person in that hospital. And there have been circumstances where our amateur operators were the only way to get messages in and out of a hospital. And we've even had hospital staff come to the radio operators and say, I'm trying to get a message to my mom and dad. They're worried sick. I know they're concerned about my well-being. And I'd like to find a way. Is there a way I can let them know that I'm okay? And we say, absolutely, no problem. Do you have an email address? Got a text? Got a cell phone number for them? We'll send them a text message over the radio. Wow, you can do that? Absolutely, we can do that. And we've done that. And they are so appreciative that we're able to help them in that way as well. There's a lot that we can do for the public. Now, a level two operator differentiates from a level one operator in one primary distinction. And that is, you have acquired the Georgia Aries badge. So, and you're a level general class or extra class. So, those are the two extra steps to be a level two. So, everybody know what level you are? Very good. Awesome. Very good. Okay, let's talk about activation. The key is we need to be prepared and ready to activate whenever we are called upon. We don't self-activate. We don't hear, oh, there's a storm coming. I better load up and drive over to the hospital. No, doesn't work that way. You will have to be activated before you show up. Please, please do not show up voluntarily. Please wait to be activated. Now, the activation is going to come in one of maybe three ways. The more likelihood that you're going to get is an Everbridge notification. How many of you have gotten a test notification from Everbridge from us? Okay, several of you haven't. We probably need to do another drill, so be prepared. You may be seeing a test drill coming out. Did yes? You, did somebody just do one this past week? Not through us. Not through, the, not through us. Uh, the tests that we will run on Everbridge is we'll send out a notification. It'll say, this is a drill. This is a drill. Do not, do not activate. But it's a way to test the system. And that lets us know that we have you registered in the Everbridge system. We do that ourselves. We will register, register you in the Everbridge system. And we do that based upon your registration in Web EOC or the Georgia GHA 911 website. Once you register there for Web EOC access, then we take that information, your phone number, your cell phone, your home phone, all of that, and your email address, and we load that into Everbridge. And whenever we send an Everbridge notification out, if you've given us a home phone, a cell phone, 
an email address and uh, you know your, your phone basic phone with the carrier you're going to get as many as four messages at the same time because we don't know where you are if you're at home your phone's going to be ringing you're going to have emails popping up text messages all at the same moment because we want to get a hold of you that's the primary way the hospitals will notify you because they send it out to everybody in their region for that hospital and you're included you will get that notification. Now some of the hospitals aren't using Everbridge yet. So they're still doing it the old fashioned way. You may get a phone call from the emergency manager. Or you may get an email or a group email or a group text. Whatever method they choose, that's how you're activated. But you don't deploy until you are activated. Now, what do you do? The first thing you do when you show up at that hospital is find incident command. Identify where the incident command is. Most of you pretty much know where the incident command would be set up in your hospital. If you don't, get with your emergency manager and find out. Where, where would y'all normally meet? Where would the meeting place be? Is there a particular conference room or some place that's designated uh, as an EOC in the hospital? That's usually where it'll be. The reason you show up there first is you need to be briefed. You need a briefing on what the circumstances are and the situation is at this time. Once you've been briefed, go to your station, set up your station. The first thing that you do, there's two things really. First thing that you do is you get your HF rig going or if you don't have an HF rig, set your, your VHF, UHF radio to the RCH that you communicate with. If you have an HF rig, go ahead and tune to the uh, Georgia Aries net, which will be on either 3975 or 72875. And there will more than likely be a Georgia Aries net. Now, if it's not a state activation, then we will have a Georgia hospital net running in its stead. And that will be on our Georgia hospital frequencies. And you should have those if you've got your emergency operations plan on the back and the appendix, let me find it. I don't remember which one it is. Appendix C, as in Charlie. You would primarily turn to for the Georgia Hospital, it would either be 3982.5 or it'll be 7282.5 or possibly 7188. You tune and you listen until you hear it. That's the key. The second thing that you want to do is you want to go ahead and log in to WebEOC. If you go into it, you will see they will have already established. Usually the emergency manager will do this. They will establish an event in WebEOC. Go down and it'll be by region. So like in my case, it would be region A uh, tornado event. Click on that and then you go ahead and log in, check in and say, you know, W4HBS is on-site and monitoring at Fannin Regional Hospital. That's what I would let them know. And you will be able to see everything going on in your region. The situational awareness that WebEOC gives you is phenomenal. And the class this afternoon will demonstrate that because we actually have an event set up live in WebEOC and we're gonna be walking through that. So WebEOC is your eyes and ears. Now, as long as the internet is operational, WebEOC is a great tool. Uh, but once you lose it, you've lost it. That's when we have to rely only on HF or DSTAR. The third thing that you do when you arrive is go ahead and tune to Reflector 30 Bravo on DSTAR. Now, the reason that we have multiple things to do is because not all of you have an HF radio at your hospital. Not all of you have DSTAR at your hospital. But everybody should be able to have access to a computer. And that's something we're working on. Now, if your hospital doesn't have all three modes, 
it's okay. Work with what you got. So for many of the regional hospitals, you only have a dual band VHF, UHF radio. That's fine. As long as you can communicate with your regional coordinating hospital, you're good. That's who you will relay information back and forth from. Clear as mud? All right. Once you are activated, it's important that you are activated at the same time that the hospital staff is activated. Everybody needs to get the message at the same time, not as an afterthought. It's very difficult to come in an hour after everyone's already been there and everything's in full flow. It's hard. Now you're playing catch up the whole time. So be prepared when you see an event coming. If we have a hurricane, it, we usually have a lot of pre-warning knowledge that it's coming. Be aware, hey, I, I may need to activate here. Sometimes it's a good idea to just send an email or a text message to your emergency manager and say, you know, how are things looking here? You think you're going to need uh, amateur radio support? And I guarantee you, if it's like Michael, he'll say, I don't know if we'll need you, but I want you to be available. You know, be, be ready to go because we, we may, may need you. That's usually the message I get that says, don't make plans. Just be aware, be ready to go. When you get into a hospital, and, and I don't know, every situation is different across the state. Access to that hospital is very critical. And this is something we have been putting a lot of pressure on all the state hospitals is the access for the amateur operators. And one of the things that we strongly dictate to these hospitals is our amateur operators should have 24-7 access to their equipment at all times. Now that's not true. That's not the situation we're dealing with right now. Many of you, everything's behind a locked door. You gotta find a third party with a key to get access to it. That makes it very difficult if you don't have access to your equipment. Because what if that person's missing in action? Now you can't get into your equipment. You're of no value to that hospital if you can't get to that operational equipment and work. So this is the pressure that we are putting from a, from a leadership level down to the hospitals that you need access to it. And the next step is planning. All the hospitals across the state are required to conduct drills and exercises. Now, whether it be a training drill or a full-scale exercise, ARIES operators must be included in that training. You must be involved in all the planning, all the pre-planning, the tabletop exercises, etc. that go on. Yes? Is that a state requirement? I'm from Florida, and we haven't heard this in our hospital. It is a requirement that's pushed down through the CMS rule that came out, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid rule, that all the hospitals must conduct, as, as partitioned through the CMS rule, they must conduct the trainings every year, the drills. And because we are the established, recognized auxiliary communicators for the hospital, we must be included in that. Is that nationwide or just Georgia that you're right against? The answer, the answer all I can speak for is the state of Georgia. And the Department of Public Health has designated Georgia Aries as the preeminent communicator for auxiliary communications in all the Georgia state hospitals. It should be nationwide, but I don't know what other states are doing. <laughs> it's enough to keep here in Georgia. But it's important to realize that you have to be aware and have the time, if not you, at least somebody in your group. Most of you, you, you should have two, three, four, five people who can support that hospital because inevitably somebody's going to be on vacation. Uh, they're going to be out of town or they're sick or whatever and they're not going to be able to deploy to that hospital. There needs to be depth where you've got one, two, maybe three, four people that can go to that hospital and, and respond. But it's also important that you be active in your coalition. Now, how many of you are not active currently in your coalition? You don't, you're not on their email list, you're not getting the emails, you don't know about the meetings. This is an important step that you get involved in your coalition. If you don't know how to do that, 
send us an email. And if you don't have it from the first screen, make sure that you put down my email address so that you can send me an email or give me a phone call. Uh, please let me know. I will direct you to the person that you need to contact for your coalition, who to get in touch with. Get on the email list, but it's important to realize they don't have meetings every week. They have meetings roughly once every quarter, four meetings a year. Surely you can make one or two of those meetings. It's critical that you get involved. You need to be there. You need to establish those relationships now, before an emergency. Let them get to know who you are. Get face-to-face -face recognition. Develop those relationships now. It's important to have that. The, we have to talk about dress code because, believe it or not, somewhere, sometime, this became an issue. When we show up at the hospital, recognize that you, even though you're called an amateur, folks, you are professionals. You're professionals at what you do. We have to dress the part. When you show up at a hospital, just use common sense. I don't expect you to put a shirt and tie on, but it's important that you be clean and neat. Please don't wear a t-shirt that's got some political slogan on it. Please don't wear dirty clothes. You know, you've been changing the oil in your car or, re or re replacing the rear axle. Please change clothes before you go. Be neat and clean. If you have a, uh, for example, if your county has a uh, an airy shirt, I see several of y'all wearing amateur radio shirts. That's perfectly acceptable. That's great. But just please don't show up wearing your Ozzy Osbourne t-shirt. Uh, and the other thing too is headgear. And this isn't, even though we don't have it listed here, headgear is pretty much a no-no indoors anyway. My mom always told me you never wear a hat inside a building. So when you go into a hospital, just leave your cap in the car. Show up, be neat, be presentable you will be reflected as a professional if you dress like a professional. Now, blue jeans are okay as long as they're not worn out, faded, got holes in the knees, but dress like a professional and uh, will be recognized as such. Again, net operations are going to always be challenging. I don't think we've had a hospital net yet where everything worked flawlessly. Many of you in your hospitals already know the challenges you face with your HF rigs. Uh, it can be tough. This past month was a terrible month for communications via HF. It's a challenge. But folks, that's the reality. When we have a disaster, we can't control propagation and make it work. We have to work with what we've got. If those of you that were active during Hurricane Irma realize we were in the middle of a solar flare when Hurricane Irma hit, it wiped out propagation. It would come in and out like five minutes at a time. You would have communication capability. Then it would fade away. Then it would fade back in then fade away. That's the reality of what we have to deal with. Our goal is do whatever it takes, however long it takes to get the job done. That's the bottom line. If there is a critical message that's got to get from your hospital to another hospital, you keep trying and keep trying and keep trying until you're successful. And think out of the box. Think of other opportunities. If you're trying to send it via WinLink and you can't hit a gateway, try peer-to-peer. -peer. It works great. A lot of people don't even think to try it. But you can communicate with another hospital peer-to-peer -peer many times when you can't hit a gateway 100 miles away. Keep that in mind. There's a lot of tools that you can use. Um, when you show up, recognize that you're probably going to be required to serve a 12-hour shift. Now, if you're the only operator and this thing goes on for three days, you're going to be pretty ragged after 12 hours. You need to have backup. 
That's why we encourage you, every hospital, to have some depth. You need three, at minimum, operators, preferably four. In the early stages of a disaster, it's really important to have at least two people there on site, maybe three, because there's a lot of information coming in and going out in the early stages until things kind of settle down. So it's overstaff at first, then send people off to rest. But make sure that you have the ability to designate shifts, 12-hour shifts, so that you can take a break, get some rest, and you, you may be sleeping um, in, a, in a hospital bed between shifts because you can't leave the hospital. But remember, you've got to have some depth. You've got to have somebody that can back you up. And it's important because when you get tired is when you make mistakes. And in this line of work, we can't really afford to make a lot of mistakes. Some of it's critical. Okay? There are some of you that really can't deploy for long distances. That's fine. But there are going to be circumstances where they may say, hey, we really need an operator at this hospital in the next county. Can you go over there and support them? Now, the answer, of course, is you're a volunteer. You can say yes, you can say no. But you may be asked to do that. And you may be have to, asked to deploy for up to three to five days. Whenever you deploy, just be prepared for an extended deployment. Make sure you have medications that you have to take. Keep them in a duffel bag. Keep them in a travel bag, ready to grab and go. Change of clothes, toiletries, things that you have to have for an extended deployment. We also encourage you to at least carry $100 in cash in small bills at all times if you have deployment. Now, I have money I keep in a bag, my travel bag, I just grab it and go. I've got the cash in there. It's important to have this because when you get there, ATMs may not either be available or they may not be working. But it's important to have that if you need it. Now, if you're in a hospital, the hospitals have been told, hey, you are just like any other volunteer in that hospital. You either feed them for free or you give them the employee discount of the hospital. So typically, if you're in a self-sustaining hospital, more than likely there's going to be food there. And I know Michael at Fannin Regional will guarantee that I will be well fed. That's something I've already worked out with him. So get with your emergency coordinator and make sure that they will take care of you in an extended deployment. Um, okay. You may get called to be on standby mode. Standby mode is we don't really know what's going to develop. We're seeing this thing coming our way. We really don't know. We're getting differing reports from National Weather Service. We don't know what's happening. And this is assuming you can foresee something coming, not like a tornado that pops up, but, or an earthquake, or a terrorism event. You may not be able to prepare for it. But there might be times when you get notification, whether it be Everbridge or through an email or whatever, telling you, just be on standby. Be prepared to deploy. This is the time for you to get your life together. Get your stuff, get your calendar straightened out, get your kids taken care of if you have children at home, coordinate with your significant other, make sure that they are aware that, hey, I, I may be called out to go. I'm on standby right now. Get your gear together that you need to take with you. Have everything ready to go. If you feel like that there might be an issue with the equipment at your station, then by all means, bring replacements with you. If you've got a spare radio because the other one's kind of flake acting flaky, grab another radio and throw it in your bag if you have it. Anything you think you're going to need, take with you. The good news is, if you take way more stuff than you need and you don't need it, at least you had it. It's a whole lot better than getting there and saying, I need this cable, and it's at home, in my garage, I know the shelf it's sitting on, but it's not doing me a bit of good there. Take everything you can think of that you might need. Get your go bags ready to go. And think through it. Think about every scenario that you may need. You know, maybe take your own laptop. 
Even if the hospital provides you with one, they don't like us to bring laptops or personal equipment into the hospital. But sometimes it's not a bad idea to have a backup. Have a spare, because if something flakes out, you've got a backup, and that's what's important. But remember, most importantly, do not deploy unless you were given the call to deploy. Okay, there's no one specific set of instructions that can cover every conceivable event. I wish there were. I wish it was that easy to do. This is the nature of emergency communications, is you don't know what you've got. You don't know what you've got to work with. You should be involved in all aspects during that event. Coordinating with the emergency team that's organized at the hospital through incident command. You need to be involved in deactivation planning so that you know whenever you're deactivated. You don't just leave when you think it's over. You must be deactivated by the emergency manager at that hospital before you leave. The incident is not over until they say it's over. Now, they may shut it down early and say, oh, don't think we're going to need you guys. Don't argue with them. Tear down your system, go home. Now, they may have to call you back, say, oops, we screwed up. We need you back here. Well, that's, that may be the case. So, you know, we're all human. We live with it. But most importantly, whatever happens, whenever you are activated at a hospital, make sure that you prevent or present an after action report from your circumstances, from your perspective. How did your communications go? What strengths did you have? What weaknesses did you have? What worked? What didn't work? What uh, resources did you need that you didn't have? All of this needs to be included in your after action report. Most of the times the hospital will have a hot wash right after an event or it may be just a full debriefing and it typically will be two, three days after the event. They will invite you to come to that to present your perspective. This gives you time to kind of be thinking through the event, what worked, what didn't work, what would we have done better, what, what should we have been prepared for, what did we not know how to do that we should have known how to do. This is a good time to put all that in your after action report. It's a valuable tool for the hospitals. It's a valuable tool for Department of Public Health, and it's a valuable tool for us in Georgia Aries that we know what can we do better to train ourselves for future events such as this. Whenever there is training, take advantage of it. It may not be specific to hospital emergency communications, but if it relates to digital communications or different modes of communication, Take the training if it's available to you. You can never learn too much. It's important to have that basis uh, that you can rely upon. When there are drills and exercises, make a point to be involved. Participate in anything the hospital is putting on. So I think we're turning over to your section now. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve Jonas. If this one works, I'll use it. It doesn't? Okay. Okay. Mine's going to be very brief because I don't have much time left. I'd like to talk. Um, yep. Okay, it was like every three emergency services black lines being engaged. We're there when the hospital leaves the cell phone. Internet for telephones. They had a power failure. The backup generator failed. The internet system went down because the equipment couldn't get electricity to run. When they got done, they found out also that the cell phone 
became very spotty because of all of the influx of people using their cell phones passing through from Florida. They had no communication for almost 24 hours. We're there to take that problem off their hands. So that's the big reason we're there. The regional hospitals need to be able to communicate with the RCH. If you can do it by 2 meter 440, that's great. But in Region J, where I'm from, you can't do it. We cover from the South Carolina line to the Florida line. So all of our hospitals have HF radios involved with them. Uh, amateur radio can be used to send tactical or logistical messages. Most of the tac tactical will be handled using voice with HF and D-Star. The logistical messages mostly will go by Winlink because they're more detailed and we can send data much easier through a Winlink message with an attachment. We support primarily the Georgia hospitals, the long-term care facilities, the assisted living facilities, and hospice agencies. That's all been brought on by the change in the CMS rules this year. Up till now, none of the others, just the hospitals were all we dealt with. Now they're all starting to look for us for help. And when you start looking at how many nursing homes, hospice, long-term care facilities and things, we don't have enough operators. Also, we have the EMAs, the Department of Public Health, and the Georgia Hospital Association. So what we will do is we will start at the top of the list. The hospitals come first. If we have other operators, we can move down and pick up the next one in line. But that's the way it's going to work until we run out of operators. And at that point, there's nothing we can do about it. So we can always use more help. And the only way we're going to get it is if we can recruit more people into helping with us. Now, on the coast, we've had two hurricanes in the last two years. And I can tell you in Chatham County, we had four facilities with radio operators, and we had nine radio operators. So that gives you some idea how bad we're hurting for operators. And a lot of people will not volunteer, and there's nothing we can do to force them. I wish we could. But uh, better recruiting is about the only, only method that I know of that we can, can do with it. Okay, we've talked about the uh, modes of communication. Tactical communications by voice. Uh, primary mode for logistical will be with uh, Winlink. Preferably peer-to-peer -peer when possible. Through a gateway when it's not. Uh, the primary method of the digital communication is the 213. Also, when we're doing any traffic of any kind, you need to keep a 309 running. And uh, that form is also available in WinLink, and we'll cover that more in the uh, WinLink class that's coming up a little later on today. Uh, when we're operating our nets, if the state's operating a voice net on HF and we have two hospitals that need to pass traffic, what they need to do is contact the net control and then step aside to another frequency like a hospital frequency to do the whatever traffic needs to be passed and then come back and check back in with net control when they're done. Don't try to do it on the regular net. Move off to the side. Okay, health and welfare traffic will be referred to the nearest NTS station or Saturn net. <clears throat> okay, Georgia Aries will operate the normal net 3975 uh, or 7287.5. Those will be where the voice traffic is going. Anything other than that, if there's something between the hospitals, again, we move it off. 
take care of it, and then come back. Okay, we've talked about uh, tactical call signs relating to location and nature of an assignment shall be made prior to the, uh, at the time of deployment. Uh, tactical call signs will be retained throughout the assignment for each location. That way we don't need to worry, who's the operator I'm trying to get a hold of? We go for the call sign, the tactical call sign. Okay, we've got the recommended hospital equipment and we have extra copies up here. And uh, Appendix B is our personal equipment. And I got in in my time. Yeah, you got 10 minutes. No, I got five minutes because we're supposed to quit five early. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. So, what's the concern of having operators? Yes. If an operator ship, an operator's willing but hasn't been through training, is he still allowed to support the If he can walk and he can talk, I can put him to work. You know, I might, I might wind up sitting with him for a while to make sure we're good to go. But yeah, if you've got an operator that can operate, put him to work. And if it's even on the HF, you can play control operator if you need to. But yes, any anytime. I wanted to touch on that uh, referral to Saturn and uh, <coughs> international traffic. That, that implies a certain amount of tempo uh, that we don't handle with people's names. Elaborate on that. Okay. The health and welfare traffic, all we do is refer that to the Saturn or no, we're not going to do anything. That's why we're going to do the HIPAA course, too. Right. But even when we're dealing hospital to hospital, we don't use patient names or anything like that. We can use a number, patient A, patient 2. We haven't given them any kind of information, but we, we have designated a person for that. But no, you cannot do anything where you're going to delve into personal aspects of a of a patient at all. We'll cover that in the HIPAA. Yeah, it will be in the HIPAA class. <clears throat> Is the video of this class going to be on the Georgia website or can it be? Yes, it will. Sure. We're working that way. What about flu shots? Flu shots. That actually, I believe, falls under the jurisdiction of the hospital. Most of them like to require it. Most of them, when they do require it, usually will offer it. Uh, if you're never in the area where patients are involved, you may not have to have it, but I, I'm going to defer to the EMs in the local hospitals for that decision. Scott. How do we go about uh, if a hospital does not have a call sign? Who is responsible for getting that set up? I would go to the local emergency uh, hospital manager and speak with them about it. It requires four people, and they have to meet at least one time a year for at least five minutes. Four licensed amateurs. I think. Yeah, four licensed amateurs. And you can take, your, in your, like in our county, we just got four guys together, and we said we want to form, we want to form this class, uh, form this club. We call it Fannin County, Fannin Regional Hospital Radio Club. I yeah. Think we call it. FRH. You just there's a form on ARRL. You fill out that form. You submit it. <clears throat> you'll immediately takes about a week. You'll get back a call sign for your club. And it will be a sequential call sign. Then if you want to go shopping for a vanity call, you can, but you don't have to. But really, it would be nice if all of the hospitals had it. That way, we don't worry about an operator anywhere. We just immediately go for the hospital itself. So I have two questions. Um, in the Katrina event, hospitals were desperately in need of communications. Okay, so I can imagine that, I noticed in Georgia you guys stocked the regional hospitals in the event of a disaster. Did you guys actually work with your hospitals to discuss the size of the ordering list you need to be transmitting? I cannot speak to that. I do not know. I know they have some forms that they've worked on, but I do not know per se what the size of these forms are. Maybe that would be an exercise if you want to try it out, because to order for my OR for one day would probably be 20,000 pieces of a year. 
the, there are certain forms that the hospitals have indicated that they need to pass, um, and they're in our Appendix E, which you can go out on our ARIES website and, and see this, but primarily they need to know available means of communication, facility operating status, the staffing status, facility structural integrity, status of evacuations or sheltering, critical medical services, i.e. critical care, trauma, critical service status, utility, sanitation, ventilation, etc., critical health care delivery status, the bed status, laboratory, radiology, patient, patient or resident transport, uh, patient resident tracking, as well as critical acute resource needs, materials, medications, etc. Many times they're going to come to you and they're going to say, we need this list of medications, we need it to get to our RCH. And we would be transmitting it. We would scan it, we would send it via Winlink. My second question is, are you guys familiar with the shares opportunities for handling some of this? Yep. Yes, we are. Right now the hospitals are, we're, we'll call it, we're at baby steps. <clears throat> we're, we're just now getting up to where we can communicate via standard Winlink. Shares is something down the road when hospitals get million dollar grants uh, and can afford Pactor modems and things like that. We'll get toward that goal. Hopefully we will. They're still struggling in Georgia to get the EMAs up to shares. Just to remind you, all the shares is the exact same software. Mm -hmm. Yep. But the problem is we still got to get the hospitals to have radios. By and large, most of the hospitals in the state of Georgia have no radios. Yeah. To give you an overview, we have hospitals uh, hospitals that are operational on amateur radios right now, numbers roughly about, what would you say? 40, 45, 50. 45, 50 maybe. We have 139 hospitals with ERs in the state. We have a long ways to go. Well, we've got 13 in Region J, and I know for a fact that all but two have full radio equipment because we purchased it at the region level for all of them. Has everyone signed the GEMA form that went across? No. If you have not signed it, raise your hand and we'll grab them. We can pick them up. Is that all of ours? Yeah. Okay. And also, if you if you want to get your certificate through GEMA, you had you have to have gone on to the GEMA website and actually registered for training. Um, and that way they'll be able to match your last four digits of your social up with your account and make those certificates available. So if you haven't signed up, go ahead and put it on here and be looking for the sheets at all your classes. Make sure you get credit for it. Thank you folks very much. Again, if you have questions, shoot us an email. Again, my email is w4hbs at arrl.net. Yes.